Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Investor's Guide to Thriving's first edition of 2021. It feels just like the first edition of 2020, except with one extra year of pandemic. Well, indeed, the last 12 months, we've seen the sharpest market decline in history, followed by the sharpest recovery in history, followed by the most money printing in history, and an environment where any measure of valuation is completely out the window and a monkey throwing darts at a list of tech stocks outperformed all your hedge funds. Somehow Jerome putting the Powell in Powell, Powell somehow managed to surprise markets today with the radical suggestion that we might see a little inflation soon. Gold didn't get the memo. Tonight, of course, we're gonna feature Mr. Larry Berman, host of Berman's Call on BNN, and our chief investment officer at ETF Capital Management. He'll be discussing his pro eyes probability indicator, which you can follow in addition to getting your fix of Berman content at bermanscall.com forward slash pro dash eyes. That's E-Y-E-S. The rest of the time this evening, Larry will focus mostly on his views on the business cycle and rates and explain why in addition to a third and possibly fourth wave of COVID, we need to watch out for bond vigilantes. I always thought that's when Bruce Wayne decides to sell some of this fixed income. Larry and I would really like to thank those of you who have joined us at Investor's Guide to Thriving in supporting childhood leukemia research at SickKids and Alzheimer's and dementia research at the Baycrest Foundation. With your help, we've been able to raise over 450,000 for Baycrest, and we're about to break 100,000 for SickKids, which we added in more recent years after they literally saved my daughter's life in 2016. I'm eternally grateful to Sick Kids and to all of you who have made donations. If you would still like to make a donation, please use the links in the survey you'll receive after the event. This is how we're able to track and match your generosity. That survey is also your gateway to access the webinar replay. It'll arrive in your email tomorrow morning. Tell us how you did and you'll get access to all of the above and be able to submit questions for next week. Investor's Guide to Thriving is brought to you through a lot of hard work and let's not forget sponsorship. A big thanks go out to our excellent partners, BMO ETFs. They are our top sponsor and partner in ETF education since 2009. Here tonight to pontificate about the evolution of responsible investing and how you too can invest for impact using ETFs. I know he's the right guy to talk about responsible investing because he recently traded his Mini Cooper for a Subaru. So folks, live from Vancouver, here is Director of ETFs for BMO ETFs, Mr. Responsible, Mark Webster. Thank you very much, Jared, and thank you everybody for joining this evening. Um, as, as Jared mentioned, this is an overview of how to understand responsible investment. And it's a really difficult topic because the, the amount of technical expertise that is required to really distill the differences in different approaches is, is beyond most investors. So I think you have to look at this as how do you simplify this and make it as, as, as easily digestible for you to take the right decisions to meet your intended outcomes. And that's a really important consideration because a lot of the approaches in responsible investing have unintended outcomes. And we'll get into that a little bit later. This first slide shows how even what we would consider conservative organizations like the World Economic Forum have identified climate biodiversity loss and extreme weather and stress as the biggest perils. We have to understand this, this organization unites politicians, business leaders and academics. So this is not uh, a group of people who consider left-wing progressives. These are very grounded uh, pe people who have vested interests in, in many, many different things, but they are identifying uh, uh, some, some pretty profound issues that the world has, has to deal with in the coming decades. Can we skip the next slide, please, and, and go on to the, uh, the one with the arc, uh, this one. There's an evolution to responsible investing. It's not a new notion at all. It actually goes back to the Quakers in the 1920s and then grew a little bit more during the Great Depression when the, the notion of social responsibility for corporations uh, emerged. In the 1960s and 70s, we had the ecology movement that, that many of us may still identify with. What we really have come to embrace is this distinction between responsible investing and what was now called ESG. ESG was codified in the, 19, sorry, in the early 2000s and was really manifested 
in something the UN coined in 2006, which were the principles for responsible investing, where they set out uh, the parameters for what, what they deemed would be responsible asset allocation, responsible capital allocations. Um, Bank of Montreal, by the way, was an original signatory to that treaty in 2006. On the next slide, we can see that there's really quite a, a spectrum of responsible investing routes that you can take, each with their own um, perils, meaning uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps unintended outcomes. Um, one of the things we like to say is that you want to express your intent by cleansing the capital. The tendency is to think of thou shalt not, we won't buy this, we won't buy that. That's to some degree quite impractical. And the reason there is there's always vicarious exposure. Um, you may get exposure to things you don't want through other companies or other industries. So pure exclusion is very difficult to achieve. You may have unintended consequences. We'll revisit that a little bit later. Um, if you don't own companies, you can't um, influence them through positive engagement and through voting. And that's a very important consideration. So the two things I want you to take from this slide, what do you own or avo uh, avoid owning? So that's what we call the first part of the, the issue. And the second part is, how do you act as a steward in guiding capital? So does your asset manager fulfill the promise or your expectation in the, uh, in the exposure that you've chosen? If we look at the next slide, I think this, this gives you a great indication of, of the easiest way to consider um, ESG or responsible investing. One of the things to ask quite humbly is, to what degree are, you, are the choices you make helping to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals. These were created a number of years ago to make the world a better place. If we take what would be universally considered the, 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 the hottest topic, excluding carbon or fossil uh, energy sources, you would condemn many parts of the developing world to continued pover poverty and hunger. You would, uh, you would not be able to address unsanitary conditions. You would not be able to improve medical care. You would not be able to improve um, education and so on. So by excluding certain things, you may actually not be embracing these UN uh, sustainable development goals. And that's what I mean when I talk about unintended consequences. Now, that we, we always spend most of our time um, looking at the front end of the puzzle, meaning what is the exposure? Can you flip to the next slide, uh, Stephen? What you really want to know is, does your asset manager engage on, and you can see some of these um, um, UN sustainable dividend goals and, and intents uh, outlined on the left, uh, and how do they vote when it comes time to, to, to take part in proxy uh, sessions? Um, it's only through uniting these two that defining the exposure, but also tracking the asset manager's behavior that you can realize the true intent of cleansing your capital. Now, one of the things that we look at all the time in, in, in looking at ESG for, for clients is, is getting down to the crux of the real issues, getting past the myths and looking at the materiality of the screens that are used in this type of uh, approach. So if you look at the most common myths uh, it's a breach of fiduciary duty for those who say that they don't want to embrace it. It's niche, meaning this is just some kind of style. Um, really not true at all. In fact, ESG, Environment, Society and Governance, is actually a fiduciary concept because it recognizes the materiality and the impact that it has on financial risks. Um, we'll look at uh, whether this is niche or not, and we'll also look at whether or not this uh, um, 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 compromises return expectations. So on the next slide, you know, we talked a little bit about how ESG is, a, is essentially it's a risk management approach. Um, on the left, we see BP's collapse after the Gulf of Mexico disaster, TEPCO's, the Fukushima nuclear meltdown in Japan, uh, Valiant um, in there for Canadian content, and then we've got Volkswagen and Equifax. So you can see the cost of transgressing expected norms 
is rather great. Um, this is quite, for those of us who are um, old enough to remember when the Exxon Valdez spilled oil off the Alaskan coast, there was barely a ripple in their stock price. Today, the market votes quickly and savagely, and it can eviscerate your, um, uh, your stock price very, very quickly. That's why ESG is indeed uh, a core uh, risk management and fiduciary concept. If we look on the next page, I, want, I believe you'll get copies of this if you ask for it, but this is just an indication of very worthy organizations, institutions, which have shown a positive causation between ESG scores and performance. So you don't give up any performance. Um, if we could look at the next slide, um, we often use the word greenwashing to um, address companies that, well, I don't know if misrepresent is the right word, but certainly are not forthcoming in the degree to which they have um, cleansed capital or, or um, uh, conformed to expectations. Um, you also see that in asset managers, so you have to be very, very careful. Uh, if you look at the number of new signatories to that UNPRI, that, that, that uh, Concord that we signed onto in 2006, you can see that the asset management world is moving very, very quickly in this direction. Uh, you do have to worry to some degree about manager greenwashing. Um, you see that particularly when it comes to voting. Uh, there have been articles in the last week to 10 days on how uh, U.S. asset managers who are UNPRI signatories do not necessarily vote against management, even though as part of their um, 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 pledge in joining the UNPRI, they are, they are bound to do so when it, when it, um, when it uh, behooves them. To, um, uh, to act in, uh, in, in investor in long-term investor interests. Um, now maybe we can flip over again, uh, Stephen. Thank you. Um, talking a little bit about materiality and, um, and, and cleansing capital. Um, here's just a snapshot. It may be difficult for you to see, but you've got two components there, one in yellow, one in blue. They're almost mirror images of one another over time. Uh, the MSCI world has a cumulative return over that period of time uh, of 229.79. The MSCI ESG world, so exactly the same index, but screened and ranked by ESG score, has a rank of 229.7. So you're giving up nine basis points of difference over that period of time going back to September 2007. So... Uh, over that period of not, not quite 14 years, 13 and a half years almost, we're looking at, at negligible difference between them. You do not give up anything in expected returns when you embrace this type of strategy. What you can also see by looking at this, and we've highlighted some numbers in green, you lower the carbon score, uh, both for emissions and intensity. What's interesting, if you look in the right in the middle of the slide, there's a fair amount of turnover here. You can see that the turnover is, um, is two and a half times greater in the ESG index than there is in the world index. Uh, and that shows you that there are an awful lot of companies that are dropped or added from one year to the next. So this is an ongoing methodology which screens out companies that are not uh, maintaining high enough ESG standards and therefore are left out of the portfolio when it's uh, re reassessed every year. If we look at the ne next slide, again, uh, to reinforce the fact that you're not giving anything up, here is our ZBAL, the Balanced Global 6040 Portfolio, contrasted to ZESG, another uh, ESG-flavored uh, Global 6040 Balanced Mandate. And you can see these are very, you know, almost overlaid on one another, very, very slight difference between the two of them over the last year. What's uh, really interesting is that over the same period of time, the Caisse de Depot, the very large Quebec pension plan, had a return of 7.7%. So right in between these two. OMERS, the very large Ontario pension plan, over this time frame, lost 2.7%. So you can see you are not giving up anything by embracing ESG or integrating it into your investment process. Um, just a quick uh, look at the next slide. Um, you can see we've got Canadian, US, international, and global on the left side of this slide. 
uh, we on the on the right hand side of the slide are the things that I would urge you to look at. Uh, we do have fixed income as well in the middle, but where I think the if you're looking at ease of allocation towards ESG or responsible investing, the balance 6040 is is a perfect place to start because it covers all geographies, covers stocks and bonds, covers different capitalizations. So it can be a perfect core holding to help you cleanse your capital. For those of you who are more interested in income approaches, you can uh, look at our global high dividend, which is based on an ESG universe, but uses the covered call mandates for which we're so well known um, to add additional income. Now, if we continue to the next uh, couple of slides, uh, maybe jump the next one uh, on, is your manager a good steward of capital? I mentioned this before, this is the front end and the back end. Does your asset manager's behavior fully realize the objective that you hope to achieve by cleansing your exposures? Here's just an example of how we engaged Amazon over the years and some of the things that they've done when we have collaborated with other asset managers to achieve um, um, a, a, a better outcome with, with stocks that we hold. And I think that's important because you now you're seeing more and more asset managers pool their efforts um, to make good things happen. So you can see that uh, early engagements um, uh, resulted in the appointment of the first head of sustainability, subsequently working to uh, net carbon emissions. If we flip to the next slide, uh, please, Stephen. Um, for those of us who were investing 20 odd years ago when uh, we had the, the huge tech rally um, the term convergence was used, and we're actually, this slide is great, it was in the Financial Times last week, I believe. Um, but it's this idea of mega trends converging, and here's where tech meets clean energy. You can see very prominent tech firms who have also been the largest buyers of green energy. So you start to see these, these two things work hand in glove with one another. So it's, it's, it's becoming an, a very powerful, what we call a mega trend in investing um, and, and good, good growth opportunities for the, for the future. Can you flip to the next slide, please, uh, Stephen? Um, we've got a, a very strong record in uh, climate voting. Um, I don't know if we skipped a, a few slides to get here. Um, I think we may have done. Um, can you back up a, a little bit, uh, Stephen? Oh, no, no, sorry, my, my mistake. No, that's, that's entirely correct. Um, you're, you're in the right spot. Um, if you're looking at a asset manager behavior, um, we have, um, we have uh, voted against management on climate issues 72% of the time. Um, that puts us right at the top of the class as an active shareholder, uh, an active steward of capital. You can see in our next slide as well, um, our voting record on different, uh, you know, in, in aggregate, and this would include on board appointments, on remuneration, uh, on, on a host of different things, that our record as an active shareholder is a multiple of that of our peer group. It's also worth mentioning that um, uh, we were named last autumn by the Wall Street Journal in one of their um, studies as the t uh, one of the top 15 most sustainably managed companies in the world. Um, the only Canadian company uh, in the top uh, in the top 20, and um, the only bank uh, to make the top 100. So tremendous uh, achievement. Um, if we go on a little bit, please uh, skip a couple of slides. Um, this uh, notion of clean energy is, is gaining a lot of uh, credence in investment circles. The, the issue boils down to two things. One of them is an asset that is depleting, and the other one is an asset that is renewable. Th thought of in different ways, one is an asset that could potentially be stranded if new um, uh, energy sources are harnessed. Uh, and another one being renewable uh, does not require the same amount of capital infusions uh, in order to make it sustainable over time. If we look at the next slide as well, you can see that um, over the last number of um, years, the relative cost of different energy sources has, has also converged. 
if you look at it, solar um, and onshore wind are now the two cheapest sources of electricity in the world. If you want a more uh, closer to home, a more realistic example of why this is an interesting way to look at it, um, in Texas and Virginia, two very strong coal states, um, renewable energy sources are now um, generating more electricity than coal. And so coal has become a rounding error in, bo in both Virginia and Texas. Um, quite a change to the way things were only five or 10 years ago. Um, on the next slide, you can have a wee peek at how um, unintended consequences manifest themselves as well. This comes from British Petroleum's forecast for uh, the shares of uh, uh, share of primary energy sources in the coming years. This is an important slide, not only because the information shows that renewals will, will climb inexorably over the next um, few decades as, as traditional sources decline, but BP has made a public pledge to become a clean energy producer in, within the next 25 years. Um, many large energy companies hold patents and have the capital to take those patents and make them commercially viable. If you exclude large energy producers from your portfolio, you may be unwittingly also depriving the world of companies that have um, not only the patents and, and, uh, uh, and the innovations, but also the capital to bring some of these and make them commercially viable. So you may be, you may, you may be undercutting your, your intended outcome. Um, the next slide, briefly, um, we know that Joe Biden's initiatives have, are already um, helping the clean energy movement a lot. The US is joining the Paris Accord. Uh, the US and, uh, has made a, 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 a big pledge, so has Europe. China is also coming on board. Um, we expect the next two decades to be pivotal in the way the world embraces clean energy sources. If you're looking at clean energy and integrating that into your portfolio, the, there are, here's an, an example of how traditional forms in red and clean energy in blue have acted over the last number of years. And you can see in the last three years has been a rather uh, pronounced positive trend in clean energy. Uh, something we certainly expect to uh, continue uh, with Biden's initiatives in the United States and the imperative uh, that's going on elsewhere. You may have heard also that Volvo is, is embracing clean energy and as, as is General Motors. Now, there are several ways to play clean energy in your portfolio. Um, they, these are three available in the Canadian market. Um, Z Clean is the largest of the three. Um, it's grown very, very quickly due to its cost and the fact that it uses a well-known S&P index. So that's certainly attracted flows, but I would uh, encourage you to look around at what's available. Um, you, you want a snapshot. Of course, you can always look in, uh, at what's in the underlying portfolio in the next slide. Uh, you get exposure to uh, clean energy producers, and you also get um, exposure to clean energy equipment providers and, and, um, and uh, servicing firms. So this is a very well-rounded exposure to a theme that is gaining more and more uh, support in the market all the time. Um, I'd like to conclude by, by recommending uh, the Market Insights webinars uh, every Friday. These are a great opportunity for you to tune in for more investment education and guidance things that we've been very happy to support over the last few years. Um, thank you for attending. I hope this has not been too rapid fire on a, on a very important but detail-oriented topic. Um, please reach out and let us know if we can offer any more um, assistance for you. Larry, over to you. Thanks very much for having us on. Thanks very much, uh, Mark. And uh, a great shout out, uh, it's a fantastic presentation. We we love partnering with uh, uh, with BMO their their educational efforts uh, in the ETF uh, world is is I have to say second to none so so thanks very much for that ESG is going to be a a very very significant uh, part of the next uh, couple of decades you know on the on the Bloomberg terminals that I use for trading. 
um, there's a ranking of, of each stock and it, you know, it like, like it's ranks a bond, triple A, double A, single A, and all the way down to single B um, of an ESG ranking and how, how good a corporate citizen they are and, and so forth. And the interesting thing here is even energy companies have clean energy rankings. So BP, as an example, Mark gave would rank very highly for their commitment to be the energy company of the future. Um, and I think you always have to think about the go forward. So uh, tonight I want to talk about the uh, labor of love that I have in 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 the Pro Eyes indicator and, and share some more depth with you uh, beyond what we talked about this week on on BNN. I want to talk a little bit about the bond market uh, and and what's going on there because that's uh, you talk about a 60/40 portfolio is is a pretty important part of of most people's portfolios. Uh, the old rule of thumb was the older you get, the more fixed income you should have in your portfolio. Um, that I'm not sure that's the case going forward. Um, and then I want to talk about a little bit what I think is coming next from the Fed and, and then leave lots of time for, for Q&A. So, you know, going back to 1993, when I first started um, writing my research thesis for my CMT accreditation uh, through the Market Technicians Association um, and the, the, the idea was I, I, I always liked fundamentals and technicals. And I, I created this index that I used in the bond market back then. Um, earlier in my career, I, I did a lot of fixed income investing, traded to futures markets. And, and one of the reasons be, uh, that I became more of a much more of a macro person than a micro, so top down versus bottom up, uh, was because of the breadth of my experience through fixed income, through currencies um, and, and equities, commodities, etc. So this indicator has the the roots in um, what I did in my CMT research paper um, when I was a strategist for CIBC World Markets uh, in in the late 90s and early 2000s. Some of you will remember the or, origin of Berman's call was a five-minute hit I would do uh, every week from the TSX auditorium uh, when I was with CIBC in addition to my appearances on their market call show. And um, when I took over on the equity side after being on the bond side for so many years, um, I, I incorporated the same kind of thinking into the equity side. What moves equities is very different than what moves fixed income. But there's a lot of similarities between everything. Valuation is, is the cornerstone of, of you know, what, what moves markets, but so is emotion. Uh, the business cycle is about the economy going up and down. That's a very uh, key part of what drives markets. Um, and then there's the technical side, the tactical side. And so I'm going to run through a, a few of these things with you. It's very, it's presented, and and thanks to CNN Fear and Greed, I, I really lifted the idea from them in terms of presenting it uh, through extreme caution, cautionary when things are extreme, and very, very opportunistic. They call it Fear and Greed, effectively the same idea, um, but the, the name Pro Eyes came to me where the ROI part of, of Pro Eyes is return on investment. And, and that's the decision making we make every day. Do you know when you ask me a question, Larry, should I buy this? Um, it, it's about return on investment and what the risk and return is, is, is all about. So we've taken this indicator and we've turned it into a probability set. There's a statistical technique called a Z-score, which measures basically how things are valued relative today compared to history. And it, it puts it into a statistical measurement of standard deviation above and below the average. Um, and when it gets to uh, two standard deviations or more, it's extreme. Two standard deviations below, it's extreme and so forth. Um, so I'll take you through uh, the various metrics. Now, 
On the valuation side, there's four different ways we measure valuation. The, the real origin of, of all this fear and greed uh, is, is all about what we learned uh, in the Nobel Prize winning work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky called Prospect Theory. In 2002, the Nobel Prize in Economics was given to two behavioral economists, well, actually given to Kahneman, Tversky had passed and they don't um, uh, give the award posthumously, but he certainly would have been named as a, as a, um, as a co-presenter of, of this material. 1979, they created this uh, idea about the psychological value, so the utility, the emotional part on the on the y-axis, how much you enjoy or or dislike your gains and losses, which are beyond the x-axis. So they're directly comparing wins and losses, gains and losses, with fear and greed. And this thinking is is the origin of the formalization of what's now called behavioral finance. It's a very famous quote written in Graham and Dodd. Uh, that's the fundamental book that professors uh, were teaching in school, how to value equities. Um, Dodd was a professor of Warren Buffett when he went to school. So the origins and valuation techniques um, came from, from, from this. And one of the quotes in their book that, that stick, stuck to me is, is, is something where um, it, it just really says, um, you know, it's your emotional experience and it's the emotional decision that is, is your enemy. Uh, when you're making decisions based on what's driving that. And, and you've got to be able to turn it up and down. You, you've got to be able to say, when people are, are excited and thrilled that things are more fully invested and, and therefore um, you wanna be more cautious. And when people are panicking and like Warren said, when there's blood in the streets, that's the time where opportunity presents itself. So you've gotta understand the origins of this. I first came across it when doing my economics undergrad degree in the 80s. Um, and, and I was reintroduced uh, to it in a book written by Nicholas Nassim Tlaib, who wrote The Black Swan, wrote a book in, in 2002 um, called Fooled by Randomness. And, and it's essential reading. I, I think everybody should get into it and understand that nobody knows what's going to happen. The markets are all about risk and return and probability. And last year, you know, going back in my modeling and looking at recessions, it never happened that in a recession, deep recession like we had last year, that the markets didn't get a retest of the low. It's never happened before. And it happened last year for the first time. So even when you take an approach based on statistical, well thought out approaches, Sometimes you look like an idiot, <laughs> and, and and that's kind of what happened to me last year. So um, even when you take a statistical approach, there's no guarantee. We don't know what's going to happen next. It's it's so clear and important to understand that. So when we look at what the statistical odds are, it's all about this distribution. And if you're familiar with statistical techniques, you will understand probability distribution and normal normalizations. So effectively, when we have a, a, two a Z score of two or, or 1.975 to be exact, um, we, we are at an, at an extreme place. And so all these indicators are, are geared that way so that when, when it gets extreme, um, it, it says, listen, guys, it's, you, you can chase all you like. It's time to be cautious, the smart thing to do. It doesn't work every time, uh, for sure, because it didn't work for me last time, even though the odds were so high that we would, we would see that. And evaluating risk and return. So the probability, return on investment index, and, and branded for love of, of pro eyes, your, your 
professional eyes on the market. So on valuation, enterprise value to EBITDA. So EBITDA is earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Basically what a company earns using its capital. The enterprise value of a company is the debt it uses, so the leverage, the equity it uses, less the amount of liquid cash is enterprise value. So what's what what is, what's the capital at you at risk um, to the um, earnings that is generated or the free cash flow uh, that's generated? And right now, compared to history, going back 30 years, where we have data for U.S. large caps, never been more expensive. We are extreme, extreme, extreme. Price to sales, price to revenue. So the price of the S&P 500 today compared to the revenue it generates, most expensive it's ever been. On a forward earnings multiple basis, price to earnings, just about as expensive as it's ever been. The only part of the market that is showing, so, it's still extreme, but some lesser extreme, <laughs> if I can phrase it that way, is what's called the equity risk premium. And that is when you discount the um, uh, price of the market, the what's called the earnings of the market. So the inverse of the PE is the earnings to price ratio or the earnings yield discounted by the cost of money or the risk-free rate. So when you bring that into it, money's cheap. Powell was asked recently in a testimony to, to Congress uh, about the, the low interest rates and what's that doing? Is it creating a bubble? And he basically said, yeah, money's, money's cheap. So stocks should be more highly valued. So we can't, we're, we're in a moral hazard here where they can't let interest rates go up too much more. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But the val make no mistake, the valuation side of equities has been expensive for years. You can look in the graphic here and we can see going back to, to about the period around Brexit in, in 2016, where the, the overall valuation of the market was so extreme that we needed to be cautionary. But the markets kept going up. So valuation by itself is not a good tool for market timing because as they tell you, the markets can stay irrational far longer than you can remain solvent. And because the markets are expensive, isn't a reason to sell. But when the markets are expensive and there is a reason to sell and there's a catalyst, that's when the corrections become much deeper because not only do we get a hit to earnings when things slow down, we get a hit to the market multiple when they're excessive. And that's the important takeaway on the valuation part of, of our model. The equity risk premium piece that I talked about, again, it's the S&P 500 earning to price ratio. So the earnings yield factored by the risk-free rate. And you can use a 10-year, which is common, or a 30-year, doesn't really matter. In the long run, kind of gives you the same message. But rise, so rising yields are hurting equity multiples, and we're starting to see that. When the Fed started raising interest rates back in 2018, you can see the extreme part of equity risk premiums. Now, in early 2018, and at the end of 20, we got the Trump tax cuts, markets goosed up, and then we got this to this point where on an equity risk premium basis, the markets were getting frothy. And we got a correction. We got the volatility spike correction in early 2018. The Fed kept tightening rates and tightening rates. And then we got to the end of 2018 in this period here where the, it got to the point and, and Jerome Powell was asked about the balance sheet of the Fed. And he said, no worries, balance sheet's on autopilot. Market does not want to hear autopilot. They want to hear someone's at the helm. 
and therefore we and we melted down from about mid December and we had a 20% correction in the fourth quarter because the Fed was starting to take the punch bowl away. The markets cannot handle higher rates. And it's only a matter of time between now and whenever this plays out where the Fed is going to get a punch in the head from the equity market and the bond vigilantes by pushing yields higher and the Fed will step in and ignite their next policy tool, which is going to be yield curve control. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more, more about that tonight. So the business cycle. So we've got our yield curve. What is the yield curve telling us about the speed and contraction of the economy? You remember going back a couple of years now, we were talking about the flat and inverted yield curve and that that would mean a recession's coming. Forget COVID, didn't, didn't know COVID, but it was telling us that the economy was at risk and that if a catalyst did present itself, and initially it was the Fed raising rates, but remember they reversed course in 2019, they started adding to the balance sheet, they started cutting interest rates again, and, and not when COVID hit, they put interest rates back to zero again. And we are in this perpetual cycle of needing low rates because the debt keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So to support the markets post COVID, the Fed started buying high yield bonds and corporate bonds and ETFs and, and threw out all kinds of support for the credit markets. So this time around, they didn't have to lend to the banks and companies per se directly, but they let these companies refinance themselves in the markets that became more liquefied. And so the credit quality and the balance sheets ballooned and they got bigger and bigger and bigger. And so it, it's a feel good moment. It really feels good, but credit spreads are very, very tight given the business cycle risk. So that part of the model that has been supported by the Fed's implied support for credit markets is, is at an extreme at this point. Now, because of all the support and all this liquidity and, and all the stimulus, the leading indicators of economic activity are improving. So from a risk perspective, the, the uh, econo shorter term economic indicators as defined by the New York Fed's index is actually very favorable. A low reading means lower risk okay, to the business cycle. It's when these all get very, very high, yield curve starts getting flat and inverting. Credit spreads are tight. The weekly leading indicators start to lose momentum. And then real yields start to go negative and, and, and so, or, or, or start to increase. So the, the, the punch bowl is being taken away. So we had that experience as the Fed was raising rates in 2017 and 2018, which led to the volatility in 2019. The degree of support from the Fed forcing the yield curve steeper has caused tremendous liquidity in markets. And, and for now, the tightening, the credit, the punch bowl being taken away is not a big problem. But if the bond yields start creeping up here and the curve starts flattening again, we have to start worrying. But for now, this aspect is still very positive and supportive. So inflation expectation. So this is the expectation because one of the biggest risks to the bond market and to interest rates that's driving this whole liquidity is inflation. Because if inflation starts ticking up, so this is why the Fed calls it transitory. It's not going to stick. Don't worry about it. There are lots of different types of inflation. Subject matter for next week's call, I'm going to take a much deeper dive in inflation and what I think it means going forward. You know, with, with half an hour of talking time before questions, um, I, I can't do a deep dive really into it tonight. Um, but I'm going to save that topic for a deeper dive next week. But, but point being that negative real yields, which is the green line, it's the difference between the, the expectation of inflation, so the break-even, compared to the nominal yield. So I take U.S. 10 years 
and we take the five-year, five-year break-even, and we subtract them, and that's the real yield. So in the last couple months, as bond yields have ticked up here, bad for gold, it's really hurt that trade. I, I don't think we're done here. I talked about overall, um, you know, the, what's happening in the bond market, um, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at that as well. So on the tactical part of the model, this is the technical indicators. This is the sentiment. This is the put call ratio. This is how people are positioned in the futures markets. This is seasonality, both the current year and the presidential cycle effect. This is two measures of volatility. So what is VIX telling us now versus the average VIX reading? And what is are the VIX futures saying about the current month relative to the back months? What's happening in market breadth? How many stocks are rallying above their short and inter or intermediate and longer term averages? So the 50-day uh, average and the 200-day average. The McClellan, um, uh, vol so what is volume telling us about uh, market breadth? And then finally, how overbought or oversold we are based on the 13-week relative strength index. Those are all the tactical indicators. When it gets extreme on the upside, again, more cautionary. When it gets oversold, much more opportunity in terms of upside potential because a lot of bad news is, is priced into the markets. Now, again, you can see the depth of all these indicators as they lined up last April, May, or so uh, March, April. When I was doing the webinars back then, I was far too focused on valuation. I said, the markets aren't cheap yet, and I was wrong. There, there's no coloring it up nice. I put way too much emphasis on the valuation, and it didn't, it didn't play out this time. The markets didn't get that lower low. Remember I talked about the shopping list? You know, the S&P could get to 16, 1800. It just didn't happen. The amount of liquidity that the government and the central banks put in dominated. And uh, we, we never got that retest of the low, which again, historically, we, we always did. So the, mar the, the indicator told us there was opportunity and we didn't take enough advantage of it. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate. But the markets got, again, very, very expensive um in the last couple months again from a risk perspective and the overall message right now is to be a bit more cautionary um uh with where with where things are overall here so fundamentally 50 percent is weighted on valuation and business cycle and 50 percent of the model is is based on the tactical the technical side of of the uh of the market so What's a bond vigilante? So historically, a bond, and the last time bond vigilantes were seen was back in mid 1990s. Um, and and uh, really have been largely absent ever since because when Greenspan put the Fed put in, the, the, which was in the late 90s, the bond vigilante went away and inflation hasn't been a factor for a long time. So now the central banks want inflation. They want a steeper yield curve. They haven't hit their target in a decade. So now the bond vigilante comes back and says, okay, Fed, we're gonna test you. But, but to think this 40 year trend is over, given this picture of 10 year yields, you're nuts, right? You, it, it, the trend of lower yield lows and lower yield highs is still well in place. But what we saw in 2017, 2018, as yields were rising, the 10-year yield for a very short period of time got above the yields we saw in 2013 when we had the taper tantrum. And it appeared at that point that the trend was over. That dotted yellow line there, the trend broke. We saw a failed new low during Brexit. And now we've got a tightening cycle and it failed. 
So on what planet are you smart enough or good enough to understand the message of the market here? Okay, Th this is such a complicated story. Are we at the end of interest rates falling? Guys, this is not easy. Anybody who tells you fist poundingly they know, just run the other way because I don't know, nobody knows. But what I can tell you is this, that if we start to see the 10-year yield get above 3.5% and exceed, not only would that suck a trillion dollars of extra interest payments out of the U.S. economy, <laughs> the housing market would collapse. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> the Fed won't let that happen. So we don't... But but what the what is the level that triggers the Fed to step in here? I nobody knows. So we have to be be very we have to pay a lot of attention to the bond market. We have to pay attention to what the equity market is doing in response to higher yields. We we have th this is so so critical to how things play out this year. I I I, I can't emphasize that enough. So. So read about what bond vigilantes are. Read about inflation. I'll do a deep dive next week uh, into this because I think it's really, really key. The Fed's next policy tool, guys, is yield curve control. The last time they implemented yield curve control in the U.S. was during the war. Very expensive to fight the war. They had to raise uh, a lot of debt to fight to pay the, the soldiers and military and everything else and the war effort uh, and to put the, the housewives to work and, and everything else. It was tremendous. The last time debt to GDP was at the levels we see today was during World War II. And the big difference between then and now was that the baby boom came. You had all the guys coming back from, from war, they haven't seen their wives in years, and they start having kids like nobody's business. And the average age of the U.S. population back then was in the early 20s. The average age of the U.S. population today is close to 40, and at 40, the average woman just isn't having kids anymore. It's a, ve a very, very different economy. To think we can grow out of this is absolutely insane compared to what happened back then. And that baby boom led to the high, high inflation of the 60s and 70s. And to go to that period where people are earning more money and are they're not only capable of spending more, they're willing to spend it. Today, the average baby boomer is, is hitting 65. You take the cohort, World War II to 1964, and you say the average boomer, the average boomer today in, in, in 2021 is 65 years old. I, I suspect the average person watching tonight is probably around 60. It's just a guess based on you know, what we, we understand about, uh, about the Berman's Call viewers um, from looking at some of the demographics of who watches BNN and so forth and, and what you guys tell us. So... The Bank of Japan started yield curve control a few years ago. And they basically said, we are not going to allow the 10-year Japanese bond to get over 10 basis points. We're just going to buy them all if yields go to that level. And so that's what they, they started to do. Um, and, and ultimately, what yield curve control will do is, is say, okay, if the yield gets above X, we're going to buy them all. And so what that does is it, 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 all the pension funds and insurance companies then come in knowing that they've got the biggest balance sheet in the world behind them and they support those yields. So yields can't go above a certain level. That keeps the cost of financing down. This is the next policy tool by the Fed. Make no mistake about it. And they're going to have to back it with real hard money. Now, all the supply and debt that's coming is going to need to be financed. 
So this 1.9 trillion that 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 uh, the Dems are trying to push through through the reconciliation approach, not through bipartisan voting where the Senate gets 60 votes and you get a bipartisan support for the bill like we saw last year with all the relief. This one is going to be a 50 plus one, and it may not be 1.9. They may have to negotiate it down a little bit to appease some of the more moderate Democrats. But ultimately, a huge amount of stimulus is coming, and none of that is financed. So we're going to have a huge amount of debt coming probably June, July, August, September, that, that window, third quarter. The equity, up until that, they're running down the treasury balances. So my expectation is that the markets will be okay. The Fed will uh, verbally say, we're going to buy more. We're going to institute this yield curve. Because if they don't say that, the stock market is going to get stressed. That That's the game the world's into now. Now, you can't be bullish in that environment. You can't like what's going on to keep the party going. You can't like that, but that's the world we live in. And the equity markets will respond to the liquidity like it did last year. And it doesn't matter for now that valuations are, are very, very expensive as long as the liquidity spigot is there. If the Fed makes a policy mistake by saying we don't care and we're not gonna support, then the equity markets will get crushed and then the Fed will come in and do it then. So that that's the world we live in, folks, and, and that's not going away for years. So understand what's coming and, um, and understand the, the, some of the tools you need to use. So right now we have this, uh, this interesting battle going on because all these um, new technology areas, uh, don't make a lot of money. I'm not not talking about Apple and 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 the Fang stocks, but in general, they're uh, the discount. They don't pay big dividends in general, and so forth. So, when when guys are valuing them, they value them as very long duration assets. And when interest rates are low, these these things work. But the old economy, you know, the, these are real companies. They pay dividends. The industrials, the energy companies, the banks. Um, and 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 on the reflation side, the 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 the, um, the base metal side of things, the old economy stocks are working now. Money's coming out of the new economy stocks as interest rates adjust, and this is going to be part and parcel of the next few months. So the Nasdaq type names probably underperform for a little while, and this is why I I put in our portfolios for the most part. Um, we have much more exposure or had until recently, much more exposure to an equal weight basket of the S&P, the RSP. I talked about this late last year in some of the seminars versus the market cap weighted uh, way to play the S&P. So the average stock does better this year than the market cap weighted stock, largely because the big cap tech stocks um, are going to sell off and money's going to flood into the old economy, the industrials, um, uh, as things reopen and we get through COVID. So lots of things. Uh, I love options. We incorporate them in all our portfolios to hedge market volatility. And so now what we own is, is very, very independent uh, in terms of, of the market risk side of things. So... Um, you know, the, these are our tools, um, and, and this is kind of the, the current market environment. So I'm going to get into the, uh, the Q&A part of the uh, presentation now. We'll have a full half hour for this, so, so that's great. Um, and I'm going to answer the ones that where people have asked, have taken the time to write in, and then we'll go for, for some of the live um, questions um, that have come in once I do these. And then I'll bring up my uh, Bloomberg screen to uh, um, if, if it makes sense. So what are my thoughts on the uh, Z Clean and the new BMO Z Innovation ETF? So that Z Innovation ETF is, um, is an index by MSCI 
based on some of the innovative work that Kathy Wood is doing at ARC ETFs. And, and BMO is um, uh, partnered with MSCI to create an index around that with, uh, uh, with some, some prudent uh, kind of risk management, not tied into active or concentrated, but, but a more passive way of playing some of those innovative names. So uh, a lot of those ETFs, those tech-related names, that I highlighted on the last are going to be in 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 there. Zed Clean ICLN is the ETF that I recommended all of last year to play clean energy. BMO's come out with their version of that. Mark talked a little bit about it in the in the opening comments. Uh, it filters in nice to the whole ESG story. I actually added today. Um, I've been nibbling at Zed Clean. It got very parabolic, very expensive. I've been nibbling on ZCLN as it's pulling back here. It could be another 10% correction, hard to say, because when you get into these periods where markets are, uh, things are being liquidated for panic, uh, th there's no real telling how, how deep it can go. So, you know, I, I'm kind of building into the weakness, um, if you will. And so I like them. Um, is, is there more of a dip possible? The answer is yes. So I, I have right now about a two thirds position on to my maximum. And if it falls another five to 10%, I'll, I'll top that up to a full position in the, in the Z clean. I do not have any exposure right now in any of my funds to the ZIIN, the innovative names. Those are very, very low duration names. Uh, I, I could see, I, I, I use a Tesla as a, as a guideline there. Tesla was almost 900 at the high. At 450, I start to get interested. 50% off sale, I start to get interested. So that that's kind of a guideline for me on when I, I'm going to start building a position in, in some of those new tech type companies that are still at this level um, quite overvalued. Do, do I expect uranium stocks and Cameco to do well? I've been writing puts on Cameco for a couple months now. It's getting away on me. I'm, I'm earning yield on them, but I'm not. I haven't had a chance to to buy them yet. Um, I I think, and I've had thought for years that uh, the nuclear is a huge part of green, uh, and the challenge there is nobody wants uh, a reactor in their backyard. Um, so there's challenges to the space. Uh, I I you know if I was China, I would be building far more uh, nuclear than I am coal plants, but they're still being building coal um, in India as well, which is absolutely insane to me. But anyways, I, I love uranium. I, I think it's it's going to be relatively strong. Don't want to chase strength here. You want to buy weakness. But when you look at some of these stocks, there there's certainly some, some good upside potential um, in those names as well. Uh, I've been consistently bullish on gold for the past several months. Celine, I've been consistently bullish on gold for the last three years. So let's be clear, the last six months have been awful. The The reason to own gold is, is very uh, clear in my mind, and it's the real uh, yield chart. And so I'm going to just pop that up on the screen here and, and do a bit of a refresh um, for everybody, let me find that chart. Um, let me bring this in here, see if everybody can, can see this. So the bottom chart here is the uh, US dollar index and um, inverted there. And the top is the uh, uh, interest rate um, is the uh, gold price and the real yield. And my contention is that when the Fed triggers their next policy tool, which is yield curve control, and the Fed is seeking inflation, and we will get some real inflation in the next, measured in years, not, not weeks, um, that real yields and gold will start working. What is hurt gold? Is, is bond yields backing up recently? Absolutely. Um, I think the Fed will have a solution for that within the next couple of months. I don't know when, um, but, but stay tuned for that. 
So the reason to fundamentally own gold, gold was cheap here. I did several segments on Berman's call talking about how cheap gold was and said we were going to have a big run in gold, and, and it's been the case. The reason to own gold hasn't changed. If you want a day trade, fine. I, I'm moving a position of hundreds of millions of dollars. I can't day trade that position. I can't stop out and be in and be out the next day. It just doesn't work that way for really large blocks. So what the individual investor does and what I do in my portfolios are very different. So please understand, understand that. Is there any chance that we'll come back? Should you average down? Listen, I, Selena, I don't know how big the position is for you. You've got to manage those things on your own. Um, so be very mindful of, of position sizing. I'm at my maximum positions. I, I'm not adding to it, even though prices are better than they were a month ago. Uh, but, but my conviction on the position remains very, very strong. Roland is asking about ZPay. Um, I've been replacing ZPay in my balance fund, um, but it's remained in my dividend fund. Well, it's it's a it's, so before I I got the ability roll in to 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 buy puts in my growth fund and in my um, uh, balance fund, the way I protected was to go to more yielding and something like ZPay. And given that I no longer need to do that, I've rolled out that exposure uh, so that when markets do work, I can get a lot more growth in, into it on the upside, given how I um, use the hedge in the portfolio with, with the option strategy. So hopefully that uh, that clarifies for your role and why I've, I've done that shift. It's because I do have protection uh, in the portfolio against uh, ZSP and RSP. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Dwayne is asking about inflation indexed bonds here um, and real return bonds as a way to generate income. Listen, the the if you have to be in, if you're a bond manager and you have to be in fixed income, then going into a real return bond fund where inflation expectations are going to be increasing is is a way to play it. But you have to look, you have to have the tools to look at the break-evens. You have to know when there's already a lot of amount of inflation discounted in those. And Dwayne, if you don't have those tools, those aren't things that you should be using. And I would say that you're much better off in a floating rate note as, as a holding in fixed income that will offset a rise in yields. But once yields get to a certain point, you want to get back into your duration. Um, uh, Greg Menard, um, who is the, um, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, who is the CIO of Guggenheim, was on Bloomberg yesterday or today uh, saying that, that he actually thinks the U.S. 10-year is going to get to zero. Um, uh, so we'll see how that all plays out. But uh, there, there is uh, certainly scope uh, and need for interest rates to stay very, very low. And um, if, if there is indeed a fiscal cliff coming, and uh, the Biden administration is not able to uh, put in a, a massive infrastructure bill, you're gonna get through 2020 and 2021 with the governments having spent the equivalent of, of 30 or 40% of GDP in terms of stimulus and 2022 hits and poof, there's nothing. <laughs> you are gonna see long bond yields crater. Uh, in that environment because the yield curve will invert signaling a recession again. So we'll see how that all plays out, but but that Menard obviously thinks that's gonna happen. But before that happens, equity should rally again and we should equity should finish the year higher uh, than they are today. Um, so a, a couple of things there for you, Duane. Lisa's asking about um, being stuck in some uh, diving fang stocks 
and wondering how it's going to play out in five years. So I, I and I, I address gold already um, and Bitcoin. Yeah, I think Bitcoin is definitely pulling money that would have otherwise gone into gold. Absolutely, 100% that's happening. I'm hearing financial advisors putting client money into Bitcoin. Now with the ETFs, it makes it so easy uh, to put, you know, and you think about, well, if I put 1% of my portfolio into Bitcoin and Bitcoin actually does go to a million dollars, then that's going to do very well. But if it goes to zero and I lose 1% of my portfolio, big deal. The problem is if you put 20% of your portfolio into Bitcoin and it goes to zero, that's going to hurt. If you put 20% of your Bitcoin money into Bitcoin and it, and it goes to a million dollars, okay, game changer. You got to decide what that size is if you want to play it. But a lot of people, are, they're calling it digital gold. That's nonsense to me. Gold is gold. The history of gold is, is money. This is a digital asset. I, I think it's worth zero, but and I've said that before. But as a digital asset, it can be traded. It's not, to me, it's not ever going to be money or something we exchange for value. It's going to be a digital asset. And if you want to play that game, go for it. Okay. So the FANG stocks. As long as interest rates are under stress, those FANG stocks will be under relative pressure compared to the reopening stocks and the energy and then those kind of names. So, so that's gonna be with us for a little while here. How long does it last? Yield curve control is gonna end that. Uh, and then those, those, those tech names will start to rally again. So again, when does that come? Stress on the equity market. We'll see, see if the Fed, uh, if, if Powell in the FOMC that's on March 17th um, redirects some of that. I'm not worried about interest rate comment that he made today. And that we've heard from pretty much every other Fed speaker in the last week. Kent is, is asking about 10% um, of his portfolio in, in ZUT and 10% in ZPay. So yeah, you know, utility stocks are interest rate sensitive because they got massive capital. And if interest rates go up, their cost of capital rises, eating into margins and therefore lowering their values. So you have to understand that utilities are nice for the yield, but they're interest rate sensitive. And in an interest rate sensitive environment, they're not gonna do as well. Banks are also interest rate sensitive, but when the yield curve is steepening, banks profitability goes up because they borrow short and lend long. So to get your dividend, bit better in banks than in utilities. But that that banks have already run significantly on the steeper yield curve. And the reaction today was a flattening yield curve. Okay, so, so you saw 10-year yields go up more than long bonds. If we start to see a flattening yield curve because of yield curve control, money's going to start coming out of the banks and going into the utilities. So I you you know Kent it's a great question. You have to understand the dynamics of what moves these asset classes and when to move them to make the best decisions. Uh, right now having half in banks and half in utilities it doesn't have to be all or none. Uh, is probably the right way to think about it uh, with a move to more of a fuller position, depending on how things play out in the next couple of months. Sean's asking if I can recommend a 5G ETF. Um, so uh, there is an ETF, I, I believe the ticker is is 5G. <laughs> um, and and there, there's different ways to play it. Um, let, let me just do a quick search on, on that ticker um, just to, I, I um, yeah, it's it's a FIVG, and that's probably the best way to play 5G. Uh, it's called the Defiance Next Generation Connectivity ETF. Would I buy it here or wait for a pullback? So let let me throw a chart in uh, on on 5G. Uh, 
Um, and for me, I, I love this this chart that I'm going to bring up here. And this is a, uh, a an absolute chart, and and it's uh, looking at 5G on trend. So ideally, I like to buy at the bottom of the trend channels. So maybe a little bit more on down the downside here. We're we're just below the median relative to the S and P 500, which is the yellow line. We're now at the bottom of the trend. So so if you like 5G fundamentally then it's not a bad time to start nibbling half a position at, at the most here um, because on a relative basis to the S&P, it's on the low end of the trend where in, in late January, it was at the high end. This ratio here going from a high of 160 now down to 106 means on a relative basis, the 5G ETF compared to the S&P 500 has lost 10%. At the low in September, that ratio was 101. So on a relative basis, to get as cheap as it was back in here, compared to the S&P, another 5% downside relative underperformance. If S&P falls three or four or five more percent, this could fall 10 more percent. That gives you a guideline of, of, of those things. So hopefully that helps you, Sean, um, there. Ronnie is asking about with interest rates for the foreseeable future years, the value of bond ETFs will surely be uninvestable. In the last six months, we have watched bond funds plummet. Uh, surely interest rates can get to two, three, or four percent, which would be historically still low for the fixed income. So I, I talked about those levels on the US 10 year, Ronnie. And and when you if right now the average treasury bond is yielding about 1.25%, so bills and bonds in the entire bond world, um, if interest rates were to shift up with 28 trillion in debt, every 100 basis points up. So if we were to go to an average interest rate of three or three and a half, so 200 basis points higher, than we are today, that is just in interest payments, that's gonna siphon um, about two and a half percent of GDP right out of the economy. Poof, up in smoke. Unless the Fed buys all those bonds, in which case those interest payments go to the Fed, which goes back to the treasury. Hmm. They're not gonna buy all those bonds, not 28 billion of them trillion of them, sorry. Uh, the balance sheet won't get that big, but who knows over time. So I, I, I don't think bond yields are going to go up. Is cash the most prudent play? So Ronnie, no. Ca cash, it's safe, but, but you got you to gotta look at alternative ways to play the market. I love the innovator ETFs. Um, these are ETFs that have put protection built into them, just like what we're doing in our portfolios. So you get a degree of protection um, and, and it's a better way to participate because what if yields all of a sudden turn and the markets rally? If you're nimble enough, Ronnie, to, to trade and get back in, I, I can't do that with billions of dollars. I can't, I can't go in and out. I can't day trade that kind of money. So, so what individuals can do sometimes is, is actually um, it can be more. But the more you trade, the more you go in and out, the more emotional you are, the worse your outcome is generally going to be. So that, that's kind of my two cents for what it's worth, Ronnie, on, on that. Wondering why ZWU has not been performing as well as other BMO covered call options. Utilities, interest rate sensitivity, very simple. So the companies in, in the ZWU are pipelines, telcos and traditional utilities, all very, very capital intensive businesses that tend to underperform. Now pipelines are coming back because energy is running, but the interest rate sensitivity of pipelines is, is, is mitigating a little bit here. So that's what ZWU is and that's why it would be uh, underperforming relative to the pure equity plays 
um, in a broader, more diversified um, covered call strategy that BMO would have and, uh, and very, very good at. Question is about the dividend in ZPay. Understanding is that it's almost all sourced from premiums earned by call writing. Yes, the vast majority of the yield comes off the uh, writing of puts and covered calls, plus the dividends of the long positions. That's another source, plus some capital gain from when the long position is owned and gets called away at a higher price. That, those are all the sources of returns in ZPay. Because dividends are grossed up, it's better, worse for tax. So yes, capital gain treatment is your best tax treatment. So for the yield seekers out there, ZPay is great to have in a taxable account. Um, so uh, Kubiak, you've got it right on the head. That is the way to think about it. Now, I'm not a tax expert. Make sure you check, check with your tax experts on this, but that is my understanding. Marco, I hold the Canadian version of tips, Q-tip. However, I was disappointed uh, that inflation and tax have dropped along with the rest. So yes, inflation protection, but when yields go up, prices go down. <laughs> So you, you still have interest rate risk in these things. And unless inflation expectations are rising at a faster rate than nominal yields are rising, you can lose money in tips. People are using these things. They, they hear somebody say it on TV or whatever, and they just don't understand how they work and what moves them. And you, you can't just do that. You, you got, you know, you, you've got to understand how these things work. And it's, it's, it's that difference between inflation expectations, which have come down as equity markets come down, as the yield curve flattens a bit, as, as, as interest rates rise. The, if we've got a bear flattening and yield, yields are going up, but the curve's doing that, that's a bear flattening. Real return bonds are going to get crushed. <laughs> so, so you got to understand, Marco, how to use them. Would I remind, remind keeping them? If that's all you have in your portfolio, you need to do a rethink. If it's an element of your bond strategy overall, then yes, I, I would I would keep them a little while longer here. Can there be inflation uh, if supply for commodities is tight? So next week, Paul, when I do a deep dive on inflation and all the different types of inflation, um, I'll, I'll go more into answering this question. So basically at a high level, there's two kinds of inflation. There's demand pull and there's supply shortage. So if the supply, like OPEC said today, we're not increasing output. The market expected them to, oil prices shot up. That is supply curtailment, and that's temporary. Demand pull inflation is when supply is at capacity, but demand's exceeding capacity, that is real inflation. So when, when, the, uh, when they produce the monthly industrial production numbers, along with capacity utilization. When there's no more labor, when there's people, you can't get any more people to do the work, but demand is going up, you got wage pressures. With the excess slack in the economy, the, um, the amount of excess labor, the unemployment rate, this is called the output gap. When, when you know, we're not gonna get real, real demand. We, we don't have the economic makeup for demand to exceed supply. There's so much excess capacity in retail, in strip malls, that it's going to be hard for real demand, people having more money and willing to spend it. So you have to have the ability and the, and the willingness. And with the average boomer, 65, and needing their money to last possibly for 30 more years, 
there's no way we're going to get runaway inflation here. So the inflation we're seeing now is supply constrained. We'll get inflation, a different type, if we have get less globalization and more home boarding and building costs go up. There's going to be inflation from that. Prices will go up. Um, but it's not it's not high demand, higher income. If if uh, if the democratic uh, process drives uh, unionization to help fix inequality issues, where labor source of income starts to go up, that will be real money in people's pockets. That will cause some. This is measured in years and years. This is not what the here and now is. This is not the post-COVID pop, the reopening. That's not real inflation. That is temporary. Whether that develops into real in the years, we'll dig more into that next week. Okay, so great question, Paul. Tune in next week. So, so that's it for that. I've got five minutes left. Uh, if there are any uh, questions that have uh, come in, you know, online, uh, if there are not any questions, uh, I don't see any. Um, that have popped up to me, Steve. If if you're uh, uh, pushing questions to me, I haven't seen them yet. Uh, yeah, they're, okay. they're, they're I, in your I, chat. I I do see one here. Okay, so George is asking from Winnipeg. Uh, wants to invest in electric vehicles, car. I'm following the Co Copex. Uh, so Copex is is a copper producer, and the cars ETFs, uh, Tesla and Neo for stock. So. Uh, am I going down the right path? So, you know, one one way to play it, uh, and and what I've said before on BNN and others, um, you know, a traditional combustion car, uh, 30 to 40 pounds of copper on average, depending on what kind of car it is. Um, green car, 150 pounds of copper. So that's going to be one way to play it: the electrification of automobiles. GM has said, I think by 2035, I can't remember, maybe it was 2025, 100% of their vehicles will be hybrid or all electric. I think, was it 2025? Maybe it's 2030, something like that. I think I heard that um, Volkswagen is going down that same path. Um, so the electrification of cars, the demand for silver, and the demand for copper uh, and and all kinds of electricity conducting um, uh, metals is, is going to just keep growing and growing and growing as a percentage of, of the stock. So there's going to be tremendous volatility, lots of interest. Again, Tesla, Neo, these stocks have gotten stupid expensive, way grossly overvalued. I listen to a guy like Dan Ives and talks about the hubris coming out of them, re-rating of this and that. And you listen, when markets are going up, all that stuff is wonderful. Everyone loves the story. It's very colorful and I get it. And for months I looked like an idiot ignoring it all. But then you go through a period like this where you get a gut check kind of thing. And, um, you know, it, it's... <laughs> Listen, it, it's it, it's a challenge. Um, so um, s someone's uh, shareholder votes at AGM. Okay, so in my experience, shareholder votes at AGM are pretty much decided before the meeting. The institutional investor vote uh, management. How can retail stockholders make a difference? The reality is the individual shareholder can't. Um, one of the things Mark alluded to was how BMO's got an excellent track record in being advocates. So it really is an institutional thing. That's where all the money is. It's important that the people running your money when you invest with someone is, is, is making that vote for you. The individual shareholder in size can be meaningful, but the reality is these days is very, very small share of the pie. But I think from, from a being a good uh, human, being a good you know, citizen, um, I, I think everybody's vote counts in the democratic process. And um, two, two very, very big thumbs up to the democratic process. So um, 
I, I think Nick, great question, and and just do your part, man, um, and be and be a good corporate citizen and a good a good humanitarian. Uh, I'm new to ETFs. Can I suggest where I should start from in terms of educational tools? ETFs for dummies, uh, simple, just you know, 20 bucks, 10 bucks, whatever it is. Uh, start there, and and there's there's no shortage of all kinds of ETF books out there. Um, but that will give you a primer. Go to the BMO website. Lots of links and educational materials they've got on ET, BMO ETFs uh, website. Uh, lots of video. Um, that would be a great start. And the last question Kat is asking, how would I, I rate Enbridge on an ESG scale? I know they're looking into renewable options. Um, I, 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 I don't have that. Uh, let let me see if I can do this um, uh, very quickly. If I can just grab uh, the ESG ranking here, um, I'm not sure this is going to pull up what I want. So the ESG uh, score is 63. I believe that's relatively high. Um, I, I don't know what the scale is that Bloomberg's using here. BMO might have a ranking on that with on their website somewhere. Um, so I would check into that. Folks, it's it's 831. Thanks. It's been a great first night here. We've got a, two months of this, 10, 10 episodes. There is one in a couple weeks that's going to be on a Wednesday because I had a previous engagement on the Thursday. But otherwise, Thursday nights, 7 p.m., hour and a half. Send your questions in, come with them to the live. Uh, great to see everyone again. And uh, we'll all get this through, through this together. Education is the key. If you can support one of our charities, please do your best. Jer and I would love to match your donations. And there'll be a link on the email sent to you uh, at the summary and the links to all these presentations. Thanks, have a great week, everyone.